Maya. So we uh, certainly are thrilled that you've joined us. And uh, if you've been with us in the past, you know that uh, each week that there is a study guide. And uh, uh, and if you want uh, any copies of uh, the current study guide, which is actually Lesson 37, or any of the past ones, those are available uh, through a link uh, to Google Drive there that should be in the description. So please feel free to grab those so you can uh, join us in God's Word together. Also, uh, on my left, I do have Mr. Mark McCombs, who uh, will be uh, fielding questions, comments, things that uh, come to your mind on uh, Facebook this morning. So please uh, feel free to comment, and uh, we invite you to let us know what, uh, how the Lord's speaking to you. On my right, I do have Deacon Paul Lang, and he will be reading for us again and uh, navigating a few less uh, names this week, uh, Paul. So, you know, we gave you all the hard names last week, so, you know, we just... Uh, you know, a few less this week. So, uh, so we thank uh, Paul for reading and uh, Mark for uh, fielding uh, the, your comments and questions. We also do have uh, one of our elders, Max Schaller, with us this morning. Uh, and uh, it's always uh, Justin is uh, running our camera. So I thank the Lord for, for all these folks that we can share together in God's word. But let's go ahead and bow our heads and uh, then we'll get into our lesson for today. Heavenly Father, we do give thanks to you for your love and your mercy. We thank you for the way that you uh, sought to lead your people to, uh, to repentance, the way that uh, you worked uh, through the voice of Jeremiah. Lord, uh, fill our hearts with a boldness that we might be uh, preparing to proclaim the truth that is within us. Lord, uh, may we not have a spirit of timidity, but may we have spirits of boldness proclaiming the good news in our hearts. Lord, uh, allow us when we see uh, sin to respond uh, to that sin by speaking the truth in love so that others may know the, the, the hope and promise of, of uh, your forgiveness. Lord, we pray that in our study together today that you would just give to us open hearts and open minds. Uh, instruct us in your ways and guide us in your paths so we would uh, be drawn closer to you. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, we are picking up in uh, also, it's not only Lesson 37, but it's Chapter 37. And uh, last week, <laughs> we were talking about King Jehoiakim. And King Jehoiakim, of course, uh, he had not a very strong response to, or well, no, he had a very strong response, of, not a very positive response to uh, Jeremiah and God's uh, judgment, God's uh, uh, disciplining of his children. So now we have King Zedekiah. So remember, uh, Jer uh, it went uh, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin was, uh, I, I looked it up so I could make sure, also known as Jeconiah at certain points. He was only in power for three months before he was removed from power. And so then his uncle, uh, so Je Jehoiakim's brother, Kim, K-I-M at the end, uh, Zedekiah was put into power by Nebuchadnezzar. Well, uh, Zedekiah got too big for his britches, and uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, is, uh, well, the, the forces, of Nebuchadnezzar's forces are at the gates, so to speak. They're uh, laying siege. Uh, we know, because we can look back, that uh, there's a, you know, uh, the, you know the, at this point, uh, that's what stops the siege uh, will actually be the forces, uh, the Egyptian forces, but it's only a temporary uh, stop. And so uh, Zedekiah calls upon Jeremiah and uh, he asks Jeremiah for a specific request. And we'll look at that request right here in uh, 37, and we'll see how, uh, what, Jer what, um, what Zedekiah asks of Jeremiah, and then also uh, kind of how the Lord responds. So uh, let's turn together and let's uh, look at verses 1 through 10 in Jeremiah 37. <clears throat> Zedekiah, son of Josiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listened to the words of the Lord that he spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. King Zedekiah sent Jehuakal, the son of Shalamiah, and Zephaniah the priest, son of Masaiah, to Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Please pray for us to the Lord our God. Now Jeremiah was still going in and out among the people, for he had not yet been put in prison. The army of Pharaoh had come out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, Thus says the Lord, God of Israel, Thus shall you say to the king of Judah, 
who sent you to me to inquire of me, behold, Pharaoh's army that came up to help you is about to return to Egypt, to its own land, and the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city. They shall capture it and burn it with fire. Thus says the Lord, do not deceive yourselves, saying, the Chaldeans will surely go away from us, for they will not go away. For even if you should defeat the whole army of the Chaldeans who are fighting against you, and there remained of them only wounded men, every man in his tent, they would rise up and burn this city with fire. Oh, thank you, Paul. And I, I kind of feel like this is one of those occasions where I have to say, sorry, Paul. <laughs> uh, but uh, certainly we see... Uh, Zedekiah is stuck. Uh, he's in a, a really bad place. Uh, the forces of Nebuchadnezzar are on top of him. He's, uh, he's uh, seeing really what God had said would happen, come to pass. Prophecy is being fulfilled in his time. And, uh, and he is, you know, I don't think scripture outright said he was scared, but you can tell he is, uh, that uh, he's concerned. He is uh, hit rock bottom, so to speak, and he has nowhere else to go. So what does he do? He calls upon this prophet, Jeremiah, who foretold all these things. This seems like a good start, right? In many respects. You know, we finally have a king. If you remember last week, we had Jehoiakim, who uh, God had to hide uh, Jeremiah and Baruch, right, because he was trying to kill them. Uh, and then now we have a king, Zedekiah, who uh, he's, uh, he's calling upon Jeremiah, and he's saying, Jeremiah, please pray for us. Now, I don't know if that struck any of you as ironic or not, um, but... Do you all remember, I, I don't know how many chapters ago it was, I, I should have written it down which chapter it was in, but what, what did God say to Jeremiah concerning praying for the people? Don't do it, actually. <laughs> you know, usually, and we had a protracted discussion, actually, about uh, that we should pray uh, for, for people and even pray for our enemies, but, um, you know, basically, here's why is because Zedekiah does not, his heart isn't really after God. He's not repentant. And, uh, and really what he's doing is he's asking Jeremiah to come before the Lord and, uh, you know, well, I might not be right with God, but since you're right with God, let me go ahead and have you uh, throw up a prayer for me. And, uh, and, and he really is mocking God in many respects. Maybe you'd say, well, he's asking for prayer at least. And, and, maybe, and I make that argument that it's a good sign. But as we read through the chapter, you're going to find out that it's not as good of a sign as it, as it actually sounds. And, uh, and so they're at, at the gates, and Zedekiah is, uh, had a cha change of heart, or so it seems. And so Jeremiah prays to God, and Jeremiah lifts it up before him. Even though God had said, don't pray for these people, he prays for these people. And, uh, and, and look at God's answer. It's consistent, isn't it? This is the answer that God has said over and over again. He said, because you did not repent. Because your hearts were hardened against me. Because you uh, would, uh, would not put aside the, the wickedness, the idolatry, and you chased after other gods, then there's going to be destruction, destruction of Jerusalem. Now remember what uh, Jeremiah uh, in the past had told, uh, told uh, Zedekiah, had told them to uh, you know, basically capitulate. He said, bow down and maybe the city will be spared. But instead you have Zedekiah who's trusting in man, trusting in his alliances with Egypt and with other nations. And we find out, it's, we're not too many chapters away from it now, about 12 chapters, I think it's around chapter 49 or 50, that uh, Zedekiah is actually called upon uh, you know, before Nebuchadnezzar to uh, confess his sins, so to speak, of trying to revolt against him. And so uh, we have, uh, so that, that's coming up in just a minute, but uh, Max had something he wanted to add. And, uh, uh, yeah, I just want to point out that the Babylonians uh, are gung-ho, objective-oriented people, and they're not going to be dissuaded uh, one bit. Jerusalem is still their target, and, and Egypt is just only, a, uh, to them, a minor interference that need to be yep. shooed away temporarily. Exactly. And, and, and Zedekiah fails to see that, see that parameter. Yeah, he, and we'll see in just a moment that as soon as uh, the, Bab the Babylonian forces are withdrawn, uh, because, as you said, they need to respond to the more important forces of uh, Egypt, uh, they're going to be back on top of them. But he gets in this false sense of in his mind that it's uh, that oh we're saved we're good and it's sad it really is because again his heart is not in the right place yeah Mr. Mark comment online uh, first of all Paul good job with all those names that's a comment online <laughs> um, poor Zedekiah no escaping God's punishment 
Uh, he must have either been uh, full of himself, e either a fool or full of himself, to think that he could get God's help. Or both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I and feel that's... like we've countered, encountered this issue before where people are trying to use Jeremiah and his connection with God, or just use God, basically, as some kind of... a uh, you know, call in an airstrike, you know, or something yeah. like uh, pray to God. There's nothing left. We tried this. We tried that. Okay, so now let's finally yep. try God. And, and Our last ditch effort. Yeah, and yep. it's it's really a sad, and it, it, it's, it makes it very obvious where their heart is, which is uh, selfishly trying to save their rear end, not trying to do God's will. Absolutely, and, and that's, I mean, that's what we see here. This is why it, I believe if there was true repentance, that God would have honored uh, Jeremiah's prayer, and that God would would have, uh, you know, because God can do amazing things. But Zedekiah's heart was not truly repentant. In fact, as we go through uh, the rest of thirty-seven and into thirty-eight today, I, you'll, you're going to lose more and more respect from Zedekiah, for Zedekiah as we go. Uh, and I, I mean, we'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute or so, or a couple of minutes. But honestly, uh, Z Zedekiah, you know, to your comments, Mark, is exactly right. He, he had tried everything else, and oh, well, I guess we better, you know, give Jeremiah a call. You know, we kind of have, you know, alienated him. We've run him out of town, you know, and, but he wasn't in prison yet. Uh, so, uh, so uh, and uh, it's interesting, though, uh, and kind of turn it to a more practical for us uh, before we move on, and that's this, is how many times, and why do you think it is that, uh, you know, have you heard of people, have you in your own lives, uh, you know, uh, had a prayer answered, and then uh, you kind of, you know, you, maybe you're going through a tough time, you're, you're fervent in your prayer life, and all of a sudden, it's been answered, and that prayer life drops off, or, or whatever it might be, and, and I, I think I worded it better on the page, because I had time to think about it, but, you know, why is it so common for a person to draw near to God in times of trouble, but forget about him when the pressure of danger subsides, you know? See, I had time to write that out and think through how I exactly wanted to word it. But, uh, but the point being is, uh, uh, you know, why do you think that is? I mean, what are the circumstances where you see this shift from, uh, you know, the, really a very, like I said, fervent prayer life to a, well, back to the trusting the old self? Sorry. To emphasize, back up a little so I can see. To emphasize the point that you said, since uh, Zedekiah had made arrangements of the alliance with uh, Egypt and the Egyptian army had come out, it's obvious that because he sent two other people to Jeremiah, not himself, if he was really truly repentant, he would have gone to Jeremiah himself and said, you know, I've sinned, pray for us. But no, he sent two other people. It's a show, it's all. Yeah. A skin deep, a very superficial, that's the word I was searching for, huh? very superficial response, not true repentance. And then that's why the psalm says, oh, give thanks to the Lord. So we're supposed to give thanks at all times, yeah. not just when we need him, but at all times give thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Be uh, And uh, pray without ceasing. Also, it says that he said to sons of a priest, uh, hoping that just because somebody occupies a clerk, a religious position, they hope that a problem be alleviated. But you get people who are just self-centered and they tend to use God you know, to alleviate an immediate problem. But once that problem has been resolved, then they're back to their own uh, selfish ways. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, showing that is there true repentance in, their, in the heart, or is it more transactional is the word I've been using a lot lately. What can I get from God? What will, you know, and, uh, you know, well, I'll, I'll tithe a little bit more as long as, uh, you know, God makes sure that I have a regular paycheck or whatever it might be. And, yeah, I, I, it's... Uh, it's not a true uh, relationship with God. Like, like prosperity gospel kind of idea. If you pray hard enough, you'll get the yeah. big house or, or, or whatever it is. Um, another, I, I think that transactional idea is, is spot on when it comes to this. Um, another thing that I, another kind of perspective of it is the idea of like a fair weather friend. Sure. Um, where, you know, you have a friend and everything's great. Maybe, uh, you know, being like being in a band and stuff, you see that quite a bit. Uh, you haven't played in a long time, but when we were playing, you would have all these people who wanted to hang out and who wanted to be with you, you know, who, who were very interested, sending you text messages and all this stuff. And then, you know, we haven't been playing in a while and it, it, it's just like they're gone, you know. Did they really care? Uh, yeah. it, you know, it, it's... 
Probably not, or maybe they're busy, whatever it is, but um, that consistent relationship is what's so important with friendship and, and relationships, being consistent. Um, and it, this is the absolute opposite of consistency. Jeremiah has been very consistent in, in his uh, actions, but just about everyone else, I mean, his scribe, Jeremiah's scribe, has been very faithful. Yeah. I'm sure there, <laughs> there were a lot of other faithful people in the area, but um, especially the people in power, man, what knuckleheads. They're, they're, <laughs> just, they're just friends with them. Yeah, friends with God when when it's convenient, and and also look at uh, the example that we're supposed to take from, which is God's love, which is consistent, agape, never never ending love yeah. for us. Uh, he is the exact opposite of a fairway friend, you know. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I really like that uh, that uh, I description of fairweather friend because it's it's so fitting, and uh, and that's. You know, Zedekiah, you know, only when things are, are you know, at, at its worst. When, and so, yeah, otherwise he doesn't need God. He's, he's a master of his own destiny, right? Uh, it, it's come up a, a couple of times now, and so I'm going to, uh, and it's been, so it struck, struck a thought for me is, another thing you do see here is, um, and actually this is a positive in one respect, is that uh, remember, uh, in the Old Testament, the priest had the responsibility of going before God with the prayers of the people. And so in one respect, uh, Z Zedekiah uh, involving Jeremiah and asking for prayer you know, was the appropriate route to go. Uh, but in the New Testament, and this is where what the thought that struck me is, um, Jesus said, you know, he is now the intercessor for us. So we know he is the priest who goes on our behalf. And I've had people say to me before, Pastor, you pray because, you know, God listens to your prayers or, you know, you're closer. And it's like, oh, no, uh-uh. We are all poor, miserable sinners who have been given the gift of God's grace, invited to come to him in our prayers. So, well, I don't mind praying for God's people. In fact, it's one of, if you, uh, if you think about the role of the pastor, one of the, the, the blessings is to pray for God's people and pray on behalf of his people. Um, but, you know, God also gives you that gift and that invitation, so so that uh, opportunity to to lift up prayer. So just keep that in mind, uh, you know. So just I, and I thought of it because it came up a, in a roundabout way a couple of times. So. All right. Uh, other thoughts on verses one through ten. Again, we uh, I pointed this out in the past. So uh, just the fact that uh, how how specific God's discipline will be. Um, their their sins of the people is the the burning right the the uh, the uh, uh, sinful evil sacrifices and so the city will will be burned and uh, very much a I, mean, I, I think well I know God's intentionality in that is to remind them of just how wicked that was and why there had to be a cleansing why there had to be a destruction of uh, of the evil so, all right well uh, one other comment oh, yeah, online sure. um, I think. There was a typo. Uh, this was what was written, but I think it should be, uh, um, oh gosh, what's the king? Uh, Zedekiah, Zedekiah, not Jeremiah. Um, but it says, Jeremiah is only interested in saving his own life in spite of the knowledge that God has sealed his fate as well as that of Jerusalem. So yeah, that's yeah. definitely supposed to be Zedekiah. Yeah, that's Zedekiah. Yeah, those, uh, yeah his, fate, his fate is sealed. There is no, um, and all he could have done, which Jeremiah had warned him to do, was uh, you know, basically surrender, surrender, and you know, and basically, you know, be be a vassal. But then all of Jerusalem won't be destroyed. Well, Zedekiah, in his own arrogance and foolishness, uh, refuses to do so. And now, like I said, as we go on, uh, and re and we'll look at the rest of chapter uh, uh, chapter thirty seven here. We're going to see that not only uh, is fair weather uh, a fair weather friend fitting for. Uh, for Zedekiah when it comes to his relationship with God, but also with Jeremiah. And, uh, and you'll see, um, I also would use the word wishy-washy, by the way, when it comes to Zedekiah. We're, we're going to see that his backbone is, is very soft. That wasn't too mean, was it? Well, well you'll see. So let's go ahead and turn to uh, uh, the remaining verses of 37 here. And uh, Paul, would you mind reading for us, please? Jeremiah in prison. Now, when the Chaldean army had withdrawn from Jerusalem at the approach of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah set out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin to receive his portion there among the people. When he was at the Benjamin gate, a sentry there named Ariah, the son of 
Shelemiah, son of Hananiah, seized Jeremiah the prophet, saying, You are deserting to the Chaldeans. And Jeremiah said, It is a lie. I am not deserting to the Chaldeans. But Iriah would not listen to him and seized Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. And then the officials were enraged at Jeremiah, and they beat him and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan, the secretary, for it had been made a prison. When Jeremiah had come to the dungeon cells and remained there many days, King Zedekiah sent for him and received him. The king questioned him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah said, There is. Then the king said, You shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah also said to King Zedekiah, What wrong have I done to you or your servants or this people that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied to you, saying, The king of Babylon will not come against you and against this land? Now hear me, please, O Lord the king. Let my humble plea come before you, and do not send me back to the house of Jonathan the secretary, lest I die there. So Zing, King Zedekiah gave orders, and they committed Jeremiah to the court of the guard. And a loaf of bread was given him daily from the Baker Street, until all the bread of the city was gone. So Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. Thank you, Paul. A couple less names this time. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, what do you think of Zedekiah now? <laughs> uh, I, I just uh, you, you look at this, and uh, and he, he, even though he wants Jeremiah to, to come prophesy to pray for him, he leaves he leaves Jeremiah hung out to dry, such that this terribly. I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I don't know what other word to say than ridiculous. Charges brought against him. I, and, and I can tell you where it came from, but, it, but we, you know, it, it, again, it's ridiculous. So Jeremiah, he's fixing to go. And uh, remember, he had purchased some land. Uh, do, do you all remember a few chapters ago? Uh, he he uh, had purchased some land for, as the king's, uh, kinsman redeemer, uh, even though he knew that. It was, and so he was going to go check out his, his purchase, right, in Anathoth. And what is the charge that's brought against him? You're deserting to the Chaldeans. Now, keep in mind, Jeremiah had been prophesying that, uh, that, uh, the, that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian forces were going to take them, were going to destroy them. Um, but let's look at Jeremiah's history. Don't you think, I mean, if we, if we zoom the camera out a little bit, don't you think if he was a deserter, if he was that, if he was that much of a... Uh, unfaithful, I guess is even the word I'd use, that he'd have done this before now? I mean, just think about it for a minute. What happened with uh, Jehoiakim? Remember, uh, there's multiple times where Jehoiakim tried to pursue his life, right? And so uh, it's just a very ridiculous charge. They're saying that he was trying to desert when he didn't even leave the land. What he was doing was he was leaving Jerusalem which, you know, I, at that point, remember, that's when we talked about the Rechabites a few weeks ago, where people were now flocking to Jerusalem because it was the last fortified city. But, um, but really, just very much a, a ridiculous charge against him. The goal here was not so much, it, it, really think about Jesus and the false charges brought against Jesus. They didn't really care what the charge was. What they wanted to do was kind of shut him up and punish him for what he'd said. So they could have trumped up any, any charge. They just happened to choose this ridiculous charge. But really their goal was to drag him into Jonathan the secretary's house, um, probably even, we're actually going to hear in the, the beginning of the next chapter about uh, a cistern that uh, Jeremiah gets tossed into. But, and so he was probably actually in a cistern in, in, in Jonathan the secretary's house, and they beat him, they flogged him, right? And, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, Zedekiah shows up again. I think, like I said, Mr. Mark, I think when you said a fair, a fair weather friend, I mean, you know, how how truly how truly awful is Zedekiah? Um, I do want to comment though. The Lord did provide for Jeremiah through this time, and that's right at the end of the chapter. Notice uh, Zedekiah did make sure. So maybe we can give him a small, like half, an, you know, like a little bit of leeway. Uh, he did make sure that uh, uh, Jeremiah was fed at least. 
you know, that he was uh, given. Uh, regu- and, and so it's not that uh, Jeremiah ate all the bread in the city. Uh, that was, it was more that as they were under siege and could no longer get food in, uh, that as long as there was food in the city, Jeremiah got food. So it was just funny how it was worded there. It's like, because you could like maybe misread that and be like, so man, Jeremiah ate a lot of bread. He ate all the bread in the city till it was gone. It was more uh, just until because of the siege, uh, they didn't have regular, you know, uh, food, you know, the, the crops were not coming in, things like that. To, and so as long as there was food, though, Zedekiah, I would say by the hand of the Lord, uh, made sure Jeremiah was fed. Max? What uh, Zedekiah was doing is just, he was just uh, exerting his paltry, uh, puny uh, power yeah. uh, before God, for Almighty God Himself, exerting what little puny power he had on Jeremiah, and just to you know silence him, and also uh, he's probably afraid that, that uh, well, the uh, deserting to Babylon is just a false pretense. So he's probably you know didn't want to leave. Uh, didn't, didn't want to leave, let Jeremiah leave the city at all. Just wanted to re- restrain him. Sure. And also, as far as the food is concerned, he, he probably, Jeremiah probably received a biscuit or something. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, back in the old sailing days uh, in the Navy, somebody got in trouble with the captain of the authorities to put him in a, in a jailhouse or a break, and then they'll feed him bread and water. And that's yeah. what probably what Jeremiah got, just bread and water rations. Yeah. Uh, just just enough to keep him alive. Yeah, We're, he was not eating a you know, four course meal or anything like that. And um, well, now I was thinking back to Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim would certainly line his table, but yeah, the prisoner uh, and Jeremiah in particular, yeah, the ver- bare minimum, just enough sustenance uh, that, that said he didn't die. Yeah, yeah, he definitely. This was not. Well, I would still say it was the hand of the Lord that uh, that Jeremiah wasn't starved to death. Because to you, I, I appreciate. You, I think you said poultry, uh, puny poultry leadership. Uh, Zedekiah, you know, he was happy to take advantage of Jeremiah, but really, he he had no love for him. So appreciate, yeah, your thoughts there, Max. Thank you. Yeah, Paul. Zedekiah was playing king, but he was really a coward. He came to Jeremiah in secret. Yep. And said any word. Now, if in God's plan things would have been different. Zedekiah would have jumped at the chance to take credit for it. Yep. But he didn't do it in public. He did it in secret. And and I love, and that, thank you, you that's where I was, I was actually heading there is, uh, once again, it, just in case you thought that uh, Zedekiah, you know, it, 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 like I said, we can barely give him any credit at all because, as Paul pointed out, and I, the word coward, I, I used said wishy-washy before, but coward is a great word too. Is, you know, he, was, he came to Jer- Jeremiah and, you know, when you know when no one else knew in secret, what kind of king is doing that? I always say, you know, I say this to a lot of people: is the devil's the one who works in the shadows. God is works in the light, and so people who are doing things in secret, you know, really should think about, you know, are those holy things or not? Yeah, Mr. Mark. Uh, Art had the same idea as well. So sad, uh, Zedekiah meeting secretly with Jeremiah to save face. Uh, before the citizens of Jerusalem. Um, I think Zedekiah genuinely is afraid of Jeremiah, Um, especially what Jeremiah says in here, and he basically gives proof. Like, your prophets, your other prophets came to you saying that the the Babylonians are not a problem and you guys are (laughs) going to be fine, and they were wrong. I've been right the whole time. Why aren't you listening to me? Um, and, And I think that if the... If the people of Jerusalem were to hear that, um, more people would you know, start believing and following what Jeremiah is saying. So I think Zedekiah is kind of shaken in his boots here, not only because uh, of the armies at his doorstep, but uh, because Jeremiah has, has been proven right over and over and over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and it's funny you brought that up. Is You, know, is you look at uh, Jeremiah's response. You know, he... He's not going to pull any punches. You know, he's been beaten now, and he's been imprisoned, and he's still not going to say, you know, back off. He, he cares about preaching the truth and teaching the truth, even in the face of persecution. And, I, and to what you brought up there, Mr. Marcus, I, I love the fact that he, he says, you have your prophets. Look what they prophesied. Where are they now, basically? You know, calling them out on the rug and saying, I told you this was going to happen. So, yeah, that's very much a, you know, Zedekiah who, uh, you know, 
Yeah, I think fear is yeah, it's a pretty powerful motivator, and that's and that's where he is right now. And uh, he sees the the on, onslaught of the Babylonian army, and uh, he knows that the end is near. And he'd been warned about this time and time again. Yeah, so. Max, um, usually, uh, if a king is serious about preserving his nation or preserving the realms about him, uh, most kings would listen to any advice, no matter how dumb and stupid it sounds. Yeah. Most kings would listen uh, to not only protect a nation, but to preserve their, their public image. Zedekiah doesn't care either way. Zedekiah evidently, deep down inside, is surrendering. He's giving up his position. What's funny is, an interesting choice of words, Max, is uh, he's not willing to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar and uh, and take that humility. Instead, he's you know he's surrendering basically to uh, his fear. I would say more than anything. And so uh, you know I've got to lead this nation until the end because I said that this was not going to happen. And it's I, I always I wonder about these things. What how things might have been different if if he would have actually heeded God's word and yeah. and actually surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar? Would would how would the story have turned out differently? Um, just wanted to point out that Jeremiah certainly, as we've looked through this, uh, suffered for uh, preaching the truth. And this is more, I'm just going to kind of uh, just mention, because uh, it's on my, the uh, question that I had there is that, you know, in the day and age which we live, Jesus told us, he told us 2,000 years ago, that if you speak the truth, uh, they hated me, they're going to hate you. Now, we can speak the truth in love, and so we should not intentionally be a stumbling block, but we should expect that people are going to reject the truth of God's word. It should not surprise us. It was happening in the Old Testament. It was happening in the New Testament when the word became flesh and, and <laughs> preached the truth amongst them. And so I think, you know, kind of my thought here is we need to look at Jeremiah's example. And even when things got tough, he didn't back down. He continued to trust in the Lord. And he wasn't, you know, uh, um, not pessimist, that's the wrong word. He, he wasn't looking at it and saying, well, I'm going to die anyway. Uh, he was continuing because God called him. And so he continued to trust God that God would provide for him. And God did because God is faithful. And so I think when we are confronted by cultural changes, when we're confronted by uh, shifting truths, and I use my quote fingers there because I think there's only, well, I know there's only one truth. Um, that we should be prepared for people to reject that, but we should also be prepared to continue to proclaim the truth. And we should do so in it with the love of God. Paul says, speak the truth, but do so in love. And so there's a way that we as a church can continue to proclaim God's word without it being a, uh, where it might, it, it will offend, but it, it should not be, it's because of the way we said it or something like that. So just wanted to kind of comment on that because uh, as we look at Jeremiah's example, I think, I think it's going to be more and more important that we remember that example as we do see challenges to what we, what we know to be the truth. So. Any thoughts, comments, things on, uh, online? One more comment that kind of sums it up, but God will expose the evil done in secret and bring it into his light. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, like, that's why I always say, you know, when you, know, when you, when you hear about the things done in secret behind closed doors, things like that, that's not how God operates. God operates in the light. He's the one who uh, casts out all those shadows of darkness. And, uh, yeah, so. You don't have to fear this information if, if, you're, if you're following in God's, you know, path. If you're following his word, uh, you don't have to fear at all, really. But here, um, Zedekiah is, um, I think, shaken in his boots. I was going to say, you don't have to fear being exposed, is what came to my mind. Yeah. Because, yeah. Another one. At this point in time, I think Zedekiah must believe that Jeremiah can still help him. So Zedekiah puts Jeremiah in slightly better quarters. Perhaps. Um, but when we read the beginning of 38, I, we're going to find out that Zedekiah is as, about a wor as worthless a friend as you could have. So... Uh, why don't we go on to 38 then? And, uh, and Paul, did you have anything? I've been looking this way, so just in case. Why don't we... Uh, it was said. Oh, good. <laughs> let it be written, let it be done. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> uh, would you mind reading just uh, verses 1 through 6 for us, please? Okay. Jeremiah cast into the cistern. 
Now, Shepatiah, the son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pashur, Jukul, the son of Shilamiah, and Pashur, the son of Malchiah, heard the words that Jeremiah was saying to all the people. Thus says the Lord, he who stand, stays in this city shall die by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans shall live. He shall have his life as a prize of war and live. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and be taken. Then the officials said to the king, let this man be put to death for he is weakening the hands of the soldiers who are left in this city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them. For this man is not seeking the welfare of the people, but their harm. King Zedekiah said, behold, he is in your hands for the king can do nothing against you. So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guard, letting Jeremiah down by ropes. And there was no water in the cistern, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank in the mud. Thank you, Paul. Oh. <laughs> it's dirtier and darker. It, it is. In fact, uh, we know we have we have a hint at how deep the cistern this cistern is, is uh, because they had to lower him down by ropes. Uh, so it wasn't like they you know just kind of you know set, you know put him in there, but uh, they, if they had to lower him by rope, yeah, dirty and dark. I can't help but think of that song. Um, I think it's what wondrous love is this, you know, uh, sinking down, sinking down. You know, uh, and that's you know the end of uh, that 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 part piece of the text is. Jeremiah is is put in the cistern, and the and who did it? It was the king's son. I, I don't know if you all caught that or not. Uh, they they re repeated it a couple times that it was Malchiah, the son of the king. And uh, but look at Zedekiah's comment. I, I I'm sorry. I maybe I'm confused about something here. But uh, he says, um, "Behold, he is in your hand, for the king can do nothing against you." Since when? I thought that the king had that privilege, that prerogative of uh, leading the people, and uh, and when they didn't uh, follow his lead, he would uh, use force to lead them. So since when? Zedekiah was a coward, and I, you know, I can think of other uh, other adjectives to describe him, but he he had no right to be leading God's people. Because all that he did was lead them into sin, lead them into destruction. And we hear that continued uh, words of, uh, of the prophet saying, you know, the destruction is coming and it is upon you. And now, interestingly enough, you know, all these officials, all the people who the king surrounds himself with, you know, well, they, they're infuriated. Why? Because Jeremiah keeps speaking the truth. And what has happened to the soldiers? The soldiers, you know, and, 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 and I would say, let's back up for a minute. I think rightfully the soldiers are, are you know, they're living, they're, they're, they're filled with fear now. And so some of them are abandoning their post. And so that's their charge this time against uh, Jeremiah. They're saying against Jeremiah that Jeremiah is causing the soldiers to be filled with fear. It has nothing to do with the Babylonian soldiers that are, you know, right outside who are probably mocking them, throwing things at them, who are uh, who have, have laid siege of the city. You know, it's all Jeremiah's fault. If Jeremiah wouldn't have been telling them that they're gonna, that the city's going to fall, well, you know, the city would have continued to stand and they would have continued to fight strong. And and once again, it's uh, it's actually cowardice, and uh, and and they needed someone to blame. And just one second, Max, one more thing before I, I have Max had some comments. How often is it that we just, that people need someone to blame? They look for someone to blame. And in this case, they want to blame Jeremiah. They're, he's their patsy. And, uh, and that's, what, that's all you're seeing here. Um, although there's going to be more I'll say, but I'll give Max a chance. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, when the king uh, said the king can do nothing against you, it reminds me of the expression, I can do no wrong. Yeah. I can do no wrong. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I won't be involved in this. So you do what you're gonna do, and uh, yeah, it actually is telling to us, isn't it, that he knew what it was wrong. I don't know if you saw my questions. I actually, uh, I would liken him to Pontius Pilate. Yeah. yeah. Pontius Pilate. <laughs> 
I mean, here, here the people bring uh, Jesus before her, you know, Pontius Pilate, and oh, I'm washing my hands of this because I know it's wrong, but I'm not going to stand up for what's right. It says this man's done nothing wrong. Yeah. I can't find any charge against this man. And even Zedekiah has gone to Jeremiah, and uh, there, you know, and so yeah, really. Uh, again, I, I just see these parallels between Jeremiah and Jesus, and uh, and the way and their treatment. Uh, and uh, you know what, what's going on here is that it's a last ditch attempt by Zedekiah to maintain the image of his position as king, even though he's going going to be losing it. Yeah. You know, it kind of kind of reminds me of a rooster crowing on a <laughs> day that's going to be chopped up for dinner. <laughs> That is a graphic, but an accurate detail. <laughs> I used to raise chickens. Got it. Well, that is, like I said, graphic, but accurate. <laughs> yeah. uh, Paul? The king's son, his own cistern. Yeah. How about that? But the point is, it's dry. Well, it's not dry, it's mud. It's empty. Yes. So what are the ordinary citizens of, of Jerusalem doing? I mean, the king's son has his own personal cistern. The individual citizens don't. No. That's how bad things are. Well. And further, as Paul pointed out, unfortunately, maybe I say, I'm, understand, you'll understand why I say, unfortunately, there's no chance of Jeremiah drowning at this point. Here's the, kind of the truly wicked nature of the king's sons. It's the king's son and then the other, uh, is they were letting him down in that pit without food, without water, so he would die a slow death. Again, unwilling to, you know, they're, the, the cowardice runs in the family. Let's let's say, let's just say that, you know, they 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 want Jeremiah dead, right? I mean, they even said that. Um, oh, let this man be put to death. Oh, thank you. I, I I'm not sure. Thank you, Mark. You know, they they want him dead, but they're not willing to pull the trigger, so to speak, or you know, or swing the axe, so to speak. And instead, they're going they they lower him into a pit, you know, where he. You know, they're hoping he basically dies of malnutrition. Talk about, I mean, cowardice and evil. Joseph's brothers. Yeah. Well, at least Reuben came back for, you know, he, you know but, uh, yeah, just really wicked. Uh, and kind of, yeah, I guess it, I guess it, maybe that's a, what we mean when we say biblical. But no. <laughs> uh, so I just, when you look at Jeremiah and you look at all he's going to suffer, I also want you to see God's deliverance. And that's what comes uh, even despite the fact the king who had the power, who could have stood up and done what was right, who chose not to, uh, that there are still those that God uses. So remember I used the word wishy-washy before to describe him? You know, how, wait, wait till we read the rest of, uh, or well, not the rest of chapter uh, 38, but the uh, verses 7 through 13. If you, if you think he's wishy-washy now, just wait. <laughs> Paul, would you mind reading for us uh, 7 to uh, 13, please? Jeremiah rescued from the cistern. When Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, a eunuch who was in the king's house, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern, the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate. Ebed Melech went from the king's house and said to the king, My lord the king, these men have done evil in all that they did to Jeremiah the prophet by casting him into the cistern, and he will die there of hunger, for there is no bread left in the city. Then the king commanded Ebed Melech the Ethiopian, Take thirty men with you from here, and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. So Ebed Melech took the men with him, and went to the house of the king, to a wardrobe in the storehouse, and took from there old rags and worn out clothes which he let down to Jeremiah in the cistern by ropes. Then Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, said to Jeremiah, put the rags and clothes between your armpits and the ropes. Jeremiah did so. Then they drew Jeremiah up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern, and Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> An ending seems kind of weird. Well, that uh, actually, since you brought that up, is that a few chapters ago, uh, back when we were reading, uh, basically the uh, those messianic chapters where the prophecy, where it was like like a breath of fresh air in the midst of all this. That's where Jeremiah was, uh, of course, with the fall was 
in the you know it was it was the king it was off the king's house but it was uh, you know it, he was imprisoned he couldn't go anywhere but it was more like house arrest and that's and so that's what le this led to here uh, I love the fact that um, the the king's servant is actually his name is the king's servant Evid Melek Melek is king and so Evid is servant and and so uh, the king's servant known as the king's servant uh, an Ethiopian uh, so someone who is not even uh, I mean, he, he had, at least by birth, not been born into uh, God, the children of God, was the one who did what was righteous. Once again, someone who, from the outside looking in, did what should be do done, did the godly thing. And it's just striking to me that you have King Zedekiah, who in his own, whether it's his own fear or to protect his own name, in one breath, he tells them, oh, yeah, go ahead, toss him in the pit, whatever you want to do, fine. In the next breath, he's like, oh, yeah, if you want to go save him, go save him. And so he's a fair weather friend. He's a wishy-washy. He's a coward. And, um, you know, he just, you know, on Tuesday, he says, you know, the sky's blue. And on Wednesday, it's yellow. You know, whatever. I mean, he, he, he's someone who can't be trusted. And in one sense, you can see why uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, put him in because he had no backbone. And uh, you know he and uh, you know he made the foolish choice ultimately though instead of listening to God's word he thought he could trust other men uh, to come around beside him even though he had no backbone he thought well maybe in secret I can plan we can plan this revolt and look what how that turns out we know the how the how the story goes um, I do like I said appreciate though that Evid Malik was willing to uh, actually go and deliver Jeremiah and maybe you, you kind of not give a nod because he said well send go with 30 men uh, I think what we're seeing there is the reality that Jeremiah was probably so weak and emaci emaciated uh, from you know starving you know no water that he uh, that he needed to be lifted out he couldn't do anything to help himself be lifted out uh, he put his arms over the ropes and so you know even a, a man who is gone to who hasn't been fed in a while, it still it can be something to lift him. So, yeah. Uh, again, not the, don't see here the king being righteous. See that as Evan Melik uh, the, being the one who made the righteous decision. Um, why don't you go ahead? Uh, Mark, he said, but Evan Melik, he kind of reminds me of the Good Samaritan um, in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. There's some parallels where. He's, he's not a man of God, you know, he's an Ethiopian, he's not born into this, uh, you know, any of the tribes of, of Israel, but, uh, but he's the one that does the right thing. Um, and it's also interesting as well that, first of all, he doesn't really have a name. Like you pointed out, his name is like, it's like calling me musician or something. Like, it's your job is your name now. Um, and they also, uh, you know, he's a eunuch as well. I mean, this this is... Uh, second class citizen, I think, yeah. maybe even third class. I don't, I don't know. He's pretty much just a worker bee, a slave, maybe. Yeah, I think slave it would probably be appropriate. Yeah, it, um, he had, you know, he did the king's bidding, and uh, and yet, you know, beautiful thing is God worked through through a means. <laughs> yeah, and then he didn't do the king's bidding here, yeah. uh, which is kind of cool. Mr. Mark, the uh, comment you made about the ending seems strange. Well, it's at the end of the hour program, and you have to wait till next week to find out what's going to yeah, happen. That's right. Yeah. Tune in next yeah. time. Yes, and, same and then, bad time. Oh, right. Same bad channel. And with the reference to the Ethiopians, does that? This is a question to you, Pastor. Does this go back to the, the time of Solomon, uh, where the Ethiopians oh. are in part of his court? Because when they show up at different times, like here, and then in the New Testament the Ethiopian on the yep. road, uh, they always seem to be there at the right time and, and for good. That is interesting. It, it, you you kind of brought, brought two things in. Uh, it, you know, to your comment, your, your, the second part of what you said, that's, that is funny how just at the right time, that's where they, and they're, they're there. So, um, you know, and I love that, you know, baptize the Philip, the, uh, the, the Phil baptized the Ethiopian eunuch, right? And, uh, um, but I, I would say, uh, they probably were, you know, maybe, uh, because of their partnership with Egypt, that there was probably an element of that the Ethiopians were not infiltrated. That sounds like they were, it, but there was that, you know, maybe they, they entered into um, 
uh, Jerusalem uh, of because of their partnership with with Egypt. But but it, it, you know it's funny because like you said, you had the you know we call her the Queen of Sheba, but it was the Queen of Ethiopia during Solomon's time. And then you, now you have an Ethiopian uh, you know who's the king's servant is his name, and then uh, as you brought up the the one who is mentioned uh, it, again. As a, as a kind of a comment I'll say here is, um, the man is a eunuch, which suggests, again, ref, or reflects to us again, that, uh, you know, that he was probably raised not in a, uh, you know, a home a, a Jew, uh, you know, amongst God's people, that he was probably, uh, because God did never commanded, in fact, he commanded against us mutilating our bodies, but probably in preparation for him to be a servant or slave, as we probably should call him, um, he was made a eunuch, um, so that, uh, well, to make sure that the, uh, the, the purity of the family line uh, stayed intact. And I'll let you go from there. I don't need to be more specific. But yes, as Paul said, uh, it does leave, we, we have a little cliffhanger that we're going to stop at today. Um, and, uh, of, you know, and so uh, he remained in the court of the guard. And uh, we do see, um, and unfortunately, this can be a challenge for us as Western readers, uh, that why is this not all chronological? You know, Pastor, you're telling us that back in chapter 32, we were reading about this time when he's in the court of the guard. But understand, uh, you know, you know, it's because of our Western, you know, our Western eyes. We're, uh, and sometimes we want to impose, well, well, our 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 Western books are all chronologically arranged. Why are we, you know, why can't Jeremiah just do what we want? And uh, so I know that's not what you said, Mr. Mark, but uh, uh, but it but it is true that sometimes we, Jeremiah jumps around because he's very thematic in his writing. Yeah, Max. Uh, about the, the prince, the king's prince, Melchiah, was he, uh, uh, is it true that Zedekiah, uh, Melchiah was one of, the, one of his sons that were killed, uh, yep. executed by the Babylonians, the very last thing that Zedekiah saw before his eyes were knocked okay. out? Yeah. You know, so, so I guess the, the king of Babylon didn't want any cowards uh, you know, uh, under him. He wants pe people of backbone. And I'll say this in a very sad way. Uh, I mean, it's always a sad way, but... Um, it was a fulfillment of what God said would happen. Uh, God said, uh, you know, he said to Jer Jehoiakim, and he said to, you know, um, Malchi um, Zedekiah, you know, there will not be a king, on, uh, you know, from your family line on the throne. And that uh, until, basically, until the Messiah, until Christ uh, is uh, enthroned. Uh, and so, uh, and, and so, yes, Malchiah, uh, you know, maybe there's an element uh, that, you um, of that of his own cowardice that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, I'm doing away with him. But I think also to fulfill God's prophecy and what God said would happen is, you know, unfortunately, Melchiah lost his life because he, like his father, turned his back on on God. Yeah, I was, it, I was oh. kind of looking at it from a viewpoint of if I was Nebuchadnezzar, and if I went to allies, I want somebody that has backbone that can stand, that can be loyal to me, not somebody who's going to cower off and run. Maybe probably so. his reason for killing him. Although um, he did put, because of his lack of backbone, he put uh, um, uh, Zedekiah into power. Because uh, Zedekiah, he was really more, I mean, if you go back to, I think it's either first or second kings. But it, I mean, it's all but says that he was his puppet. I'm, that, that's me imposing my you know, modern description. But he, was, he really was just a vassal of King Nebuchadnezzar. But yeah, no backbone. And I don't think, in contrast, uh, who, does, who, who, who is brought up? Daniel, right? Mm -hmm. And now, this is, this is a, a later king, but, but still Daniel, who's faithful to God, who shows um, uh, courage, even when he's fixing to be thrown into the, well, he gets thrown in the lion's den, he keeps praying aloud. And he doesn't like close his windows and say, well, I hope I'm going to pray and make sure no one sees me. He fl throws them open, faces Jerusalem and prays. Uh, uh, yeah, so yeah, exactly. So, uh, and, and God blessed uh, Daniel because of that. So That's, that's good. Th thanks, Max. Paul, did you have something? It looked like you were, you were looking for something and... It was the deacon Philip who baptized the eunuch. Uh, the, yes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes we should do. Sometimes we should go through all those uh, those New Testament terms like overseer, deacon, and things like that, and talk. Maybe that'll be a future Bible study. One of the seven chosen. <laughs> I was just laughing because uh, the way you said it. But you know, yeah, they were right. They were uh, in the Book of Acts. They were. You know, we need these these folks to serve so we can uh, continue to do the proclamation. 
Although, look how God blessed uh, Philip and, you know, get, gave him the chance to baptize. Uh, Mark, you had your hand. Uh, one comment online. Uh, the Ethiopian Christian church is on fire for Jesus. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, I was going to say actually Global South in general. Yeah, that's uh, it's even uh, I love uh, uh, in Tanzania. Um, it's I think the Tanzanian Lutheran Church boasts over 15 million um, in membership. By the way, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, we don't boast. I don't you know because we don't. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we we're, we're we're under two two million, and uh, really actually, uh, Lutheranism in America is probably, well, I can say for sure, is under 10 million people. So uh, just in Tanzania alone, 15 million Lutherans. So the global south, yeah, it has exploded. Uh, and that's why, for me, I don't look at the, these times as the, you know, yeah, the, the Western world, the global north has uh, has turned from God, but God that God hasn't stopped working. He's still doing some pretty incredible things. Another question, what is uh, our takeaway from this today? I would say uh, back to, first of all, uh, sorry you missed this, uh, uh, that when you look at Jeremiah and you look at his faithfulness, uh, that you, you should take away that you're going to face persecution in sharing your faith. And that uh, when you face those per that persecution in sharing your faith, you should look at Jeremiah's example and realize that there is, uh, that God is faithful and that God will continue to walk with you. Um, and that was something we talked about, you know, in uh, uh, 37. But you even see here uh, where, and kind of where I emphasized also that uh, God sent Evan Melek. He sent a non-believer to, uh, or you know, someone who was not a, you know, part of the uh, officially part of the you know, children of God, the family of God by birth anyway. And he even used means to protect and to uh, deliver Jeremiah. So. Hopefully, you know, because we kind of talked about this a couple of times, actually, uh, that we should see that God is faithful. And that, uh, so the takeaway, please don't miss this, is that God is faithful, that Jesus promised us that we would face persecution. And so we should expect to be persecuted for our faith, um, but we should not shrink back from it, that we should preach the truth with boldness. And that, um, and that as we do that, God will bless us and God will encourage us uh, and... Uh, that he that he's faithful. So yeah, yeah. Don't miss that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. And uh, please join me, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your faithfulness, for your love, and for your mercy. We thank you, O Lord, for your uh, strengthening up for us in all times. But most of all, we thank you that uh, you have gone to the cross for us, died, that you rose again on the third day. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would just be with us each day, that you would lead us in our steps, that we would glorify you in all we think, say, and do. And Lord, that as we, we look at the world around us, uh, that we would not see a, a world that, is, you know, that has been lost, but rather see it as your creation, and that you are the one who, uh, who is constantly doing new things. Lord, give us encouragement and boldness in our faith, and help us to know uh, your abundant blessings. We love you, O Lord, and because you have first loved us, and pray that your love would be uh, would fill us in all that we, uh, in in every way as we interact with others. This we pray in Jesus' name, Amen. Well, God's blessings be with each of you. I, I do encourage you to remember that God is faithful, that God is in control, uh, that God has got this. Have a great week, everyone, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see you next week.